So shall we pray? Holy Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for tonight. Thank you for your word which comes to us, word of life and grafted word which is able to save our soul, prepare us, tear us up. The word which delivers victory unto us. We honor you, Holy Spirit of God, for honoring the name of Jesus amongst us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So last week, Amen. we continued our series on the sufferings and the glory. And we looked at the call of the New Testament. We looked at the call of the New Testament. And we saw the spirit of the New Testament, which is the spirit of forgiveness. Hallelujah. And importantly, we established a few things that are paramount in the administration of the New Testament. We saw that in the New Testament, God does not condemn any believer to hell for sin because sin has already been judged in Christ. What we saw was that in the New Testament, only two sins are not forgiven or cannot be forgiven. The sin of apostasy and then blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. But apart from these two sins, all other sins, we saw that in the New Testament, only apostasy, the sin of apostasy and blasphemy against the Holy Spirit cannot be forgiven. They are called sins unto death. But apart from these two sins, all other sins committed by the believer will be forgiven by God. And we saw that God deals with sin among his children in three ways. He forgives, he chastens, or he chastises, and then he forgets. Now, we also saw that he himself committed himself to these three as part of his ways of keeping his children. And I made particular references to Hebrews chapter 8 from verse 10 to 12, and then Hebrews chapter 10 from verse 14 to 17. Don't forget these scriptures. Hebrews 8, 10 to 12, Hebrews 10, 14 to 17. That is why the New Testament in its fullness is introduced. And we are told of the spirit which governs the New Testament, the spirit of forgiveness, the spirit of forgetfulness. And then much um, later in Hebrews chapter 12, we are also told of the third dimension of the New Testament, the spirit of chastening or chastising to, unto repentance. Now, a very wonderful scripture brings comfort to the soul of the child of God when you read. Hallelujah. And I want us to read that one. Jude chapter 1 verse 24. Jude 1 24. Today, I'll be reading from my end, Jude 1, 24. The Bible reads, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. The Bible says, God is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless in his glory. But before his glory, before his own presence, he is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless. He is able. He is able. On our own, we are not able to keep ourselves from falling. However, he is able to keep us from falling. And as a father, the way he keeps us from falling and to present us faultless before him is to correct us or chasten us unto repentance when we sin. But you see, not many in the church understand the New Testament in this light. And therefore, I can promise you that you are going to hear the exact opposite of what you have learned from this platform your entire life. You are going to hear the exact opposite every now and then. You are going to hear messages which are to the effect that God will punish the believer to take a person to hell for sinning. It's because that depth of revelation and insight has not yet sunk into the church. This thing is really annoying, eh? but let us manage. Hallelujah. So I would challenge you to go back to what I shared last week and feed on that message again, 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 please. You, you didn't hear me. You didn't hear what I, I taught. Go back. Go back to the message. It was shared on the various platforms. And listen to it again. 
pay particular attention to the scriptures that are used. The consistency of thoughts from the Old Testament to the New Testament are established. And evaluate the scriptures for yourself. Hallelujah. Be a barren preacher. Very soon you'll be confronted with the argument of one seed forever saved. And you should know your foundation in the scriptures to be able to answer such a question. And I have no doubt that when you start studying the scriptures, you would come to the exact same conclusion I have shared with you. But tonight, we take a step further into the, the, the narrative of our salvation. And tonight, we look at life beyond the cross, life beyond the cross. Again, I'll challenge you to, or I'll urge you to listen to me with your heart and with your mind. Be very open-minded because what is coming is transformational. Hallelujah. It's transformational. So I want us to look at life beyond the cross. And that's the title of tonight's message, Beyond the Cross. We are still in the series of his sufferings and his glory. Now, on the day the Lord resurrected, he joined himself to two of his disciples who were on their way from Jerusalem to a village called Emmaus. Now, these two men were very despondent. They were with sunken faces. They were devastated by the death of the Lord and were in deep lamentation eh, when the Lord joined himself to them. But, but when, when, when he met them and he saw their disposition, the Lord rebuked their attitude. In fact, the Lord was not charitable at all with them. Actually, he insulted them. He called them fools. He called them fools for focus, focusing so much on his sufferings and doubting his resurrection. The people were so fixated on the sufferings of the Lord, they doubted the resurrection. Now I want us to go to that narrative of scripture and see what happened. So we know the basics because of time, I would not read everything. I will take it from the verse 18. And now the Bible reads, and the one of them whose name was Cleopas, answering said unto him, as thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, or in other words, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And has thou not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, what things? And they said unto him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty indeed and wide before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him and have crucified him. Take note of that expression, and have crucified him, not and crucified him, but and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all these, today is the third day since these things were done. Yeah, and certain women also of our company made us astonished. Take note of that expression also. Certain women of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulchre. And when they found not his body, they came saying that he had also, they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them, which were with us, went to the sepulchre and found it even so as the woman has said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophet hath spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Hallelujah. So these two men were lamenting the sufferings of Christ at the hands of the rulers, but they disbelieved the resurrection of the Lord. In other words, they were stuck at the cross, beholding the sufferings, meditating on it, remembering it, crying over it, being so disappointed with the death of the Lord, and couldn't move an inch beyond the cross to believe in the resurrection and what that had brought them into. And Jesus called them fools and slow of heart to believe the scriptures. And then he told them that according to the scriptures, Christ ought to suffer 
and after his suffering, enter into his glory. That is the narrative of scripture. And the Bible says, beginning from Moses or beginning from Genesis through to Deuteronomy, all through the prophets, it means beginning from Jesus took his time to explain the scriptures to them from Genesis to Malachi, the whole of the Old Testament. He showed them the consistency of the communication of the Old Testament on this conceptual framework of scripture, on this conceptual framework of scripture, the sufferings and the glory. I've taught this in the past, so I don't want to uh, belabor that point so much. That means all the scriptures you read in the Bible, okay, are about two things. I know you don't see those two things when you read the Bible, but according to the scriptures, everything we read in the Bible connect to two things. The conceptual framework of the Bible is built around two things, the sufferings of Christ and the glory of Christ. So practically, every single verse of scripture either speaks to the sufferings of Christ or the glories of Christ. Every single character of scripture, whether it is Adam, whether it is Abel, whether it's Samson, Deborah, Barak, David, Solomon, Abinadab, they all connect to either the sufferings of Christ or the glories of Christ. Now, personally, I came, the Lord opened me up to this depth of revelation or understanding of the scriptures in 2015. And so the first time I taught this was in 2016, heaven 2016 in Kumasi, those of us who remember. And it was a blast that day. Because for one year, when the Lord opened me up for one year, I stayed on the subject to master it. So I started reading the Bible and trying to see if truly every single verse and every single narrative of the Bible connected to either the sufferings or the glories of Christ. And I tell you, that is the truth. <laughs> That's the truth. For instance, you read the story of Adam, eh, and you think Adam sinned, and no, no, the thing is about Jesus. Today, I was reading about Mordecai. I was reading the book of Esther, Mordecai, about Mordecai, and it was so evident that Mordecai's story is about the sufferings and the glories of Christ, his humiliation and exaltation, humiliation and exaltation. When you start reading the Bible, that's, that's the revelation you come across, humiliation, exaltation, humiliation, exaltation. All of them. Ruth, Naomi, Jacob, Jabez, all of them. They are stories, something. They are stories. Either contributing type to the sufferings of Christ or to the glories of Christ. But you see, the sufferings of Christ were fulfilled in substance on the cross. And in his death for those three days and three nights, the sufferings of Christ were fulfilled. And then the resurrection was, the resurrection initiated the second phase, the glory phase. Ought not the Christ to have suffered and later enter into his glory? The sufferings of Christ were substantiated on the cross, on the cross, on the cross and in his death. But after when he resurrected, he was ushered into the glory phase. Therefore, currently, we are in the face of glory. But you see, the vast majority of the church is stuck at the suffering phase or in the suffering phase due to a lack of understanding. Just as the two disciples of Emmaus um, lacked, for which reason they were rebuked as fools. Now, even though today, we are currently in the glory of God. The vast majority of believers, like I said, are flat across. And indeed, it reflects in the songs we sing. I know that Good Friday, we sang these songs. And in the past, I taught it. It's a progression. The Holy Spirit taught me it's a progression. It starts with, draw me near, near our blessed Lord. To the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord. To thy precious bleeding side. 
That way, when he draws us nearer to the cross, the precious woman side, then now we will say that Jesus keep me near the cross. We don't want to go again. Now she keep us near the cross. After keeping us near the cross, then we now there we we build our house there. And I will clench to the old ragged cross. We won't go again. We will cling to the old ragged cross. And I know that over this is across the churches of God in the world. These are the songs we were singing. As if Jesus is still at the cross. As if Jesus is still bleeding. But there's a problem. And the problem is that um, the cross is supposed to remind us of the finished works of Christ. The cross is supposed to remind us of the finished works of Christ. You see, when Jesus said the tablet style, or it is finished, he meant that he had paid the penalty for sin in full. And that he had redeemed the human race from sin. It is finished. Jesus is no longer at the cross. <laughs> Somebody says, I'm finishing all our hymns. All these hymns are not scriptural. They are emotional. They have no scriptural basis. Because he himself now is not on the cross. Jesus is not on the cross. He's done with the cross. When he resurrected, he entered into phase two, the glory phase, and invited the church into phase two. We currently with him in phase two, the phase of glory. Now, you who wants to clench to the cross, what is your reason for wanting to clench to the cross? Because there is no salvation in the cross. There is no salvation in the cross. There is no salvation in the cross. In fact, there is no salvation even in the man who hung on the cross. Salvation is in the man who came out of the tomb, the man who resurrected. Therefore, in the New Testament, the invitation to our salvation is built on the resurrection, not the cross. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Romans 10, 9. Let me read from here. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Hallelujah. I want to hear our voices. Hallelujah. 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 And it is so because the sufferings of the cross was God's means to an end. The cross was God's means to an end, not an end in itself. Now I'm coming to preach. Can I preach? Hey. The cross was God's means to an end, not an end in itself. So when you stay at the cross, you are missing out on God's end. Ah. So what is the end? The end plan, the end game of God. Now, our uncle scripture for this series reveals to us God's end game plan. And I'll go back to that text, Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, let's read from the verse 9 through to 10. Hebrews 2, 9 through 10. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons into glory to make the custom of their salvation perfect through suffering. It became him, of whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons into glory. The end game of God is to bring many sons into glory. But the modus of Randy, the, the, the means was to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. In other words, Christ suffered, Christ died, Christ bled on the cross so that we can be admitted into the end game of God. We can be brought into glory. Hallelujah. And you see, even before the foundation of the world, God imagined this end for his children. This has been the end, the end plan of God in his mind throughout the eternities. 
even before he created the world, even before Adam sinned, his end game was that one day he would create humanity and he would admit them into glory. Romans chapter 8, from verse 29 to 30. I mean, Romans 8 is my favorite um, chapter of scripture because it is laden with so much insight. Romans 8, 29 to 30. For whom he did for know, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, then he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. So the people he predestinated, in the predestination, he glorified them. The end game of God for us is that we live in glory. Captain of Israel's host and guide, all for who seek the land above, beneath thy shadows we are by the cloud of thine protecting love. Our strength Thy grace, our rule, thy word, our end, the glory of the Lord. As far back as the 18th century, Charles Wesley knew these truths <clears throat> when there was no internet. Charles Wesley knew these truths. <clears throat> now, the beautiful thing is that when the Lord entered into glory, he did not enter alone. He entered with a church. He entered with us. Symbolically, we know we died with him. We resurrected with him. And when he entered into glory, he also entered with us. And so in Hebrews chapter 12, from verse 22 to 23, we are told of our current estate. Hebrews 12, 22 to 23. The Bible says, but ye are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, unto an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. We are come unto Mount Zion, we are come unto the city of the living God, unto the heavenly Jerusalem, unto an innumerable company of angels. We have come to glory, we live in glory. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, from verse 5 to 7, and he hath raised us up together with him, and hath made us sit together with him in heavenly places. The ecclesia, the church, lives in glory. We live in heavenly places. We live in heavenly places. Hallelujah. We live in glory. We have been admitted to glory. Ought not that Christ to have suffered and let us enter into his glory? And even though in this life, we will not have a full taste of this glory because the full taste of the glory will be seen in the ages to come. We can by faith enjoy the full taste to the degree we want in this life. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a full taste of glory divine. You can have a full taste of this glory to the degree of faith can accept. And if you can develop this mindset that you live in glory, your life is glorious, you have been sanctioned to live a glorious life, regardless of all the challenges you are finding around you, you will be amazed what you achieve in this life. For years, and personally, I have trained myself through meditation in the Word, and according to Philippians chapter 4, from verse 6 to 8, to fixate my mind and think only about glorious episodes in life. That's how I've trained myself. I don't imagine evil at all. When I'm going through challenges, my mind works in a way that always sees me living through the challenges as though they don't exist. It's a train I've given to myself. I've trained myself to pay attention to, to pay no attention to challenges and problems in my life. They are there, but it's as if I don't recognize them. Why? Because I'm one person who fantasizes a lot. I imagine a lot because imagination is, is, is a blessing God has given us. The Bible says unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask and imagine according to his power that's at work in us. Imaginations are powerful. I live in the realm of imagination. It's always imagining a glorious life. 
always imagining progress, always imagining myself moving forward. And so the challenges are there, but I don't give them expression in my thoughts. I don't give them attention in my thoughts. And that is why personally, the anchor scripture of my life is Romans chapter 8 from verse 28 to 30. Whatever happens to me in a second, that's my reactionary anchor in life. Immediately something bad happens. In a matter of seconds, I switch and think into glory. You see me quoting, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. For those that he, he, he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the first one amongst many brethren. Moreover, for those that he predestined, this he called, those he called, this he just were, those he just, this he glorified. What then shall we say, if God be for us, who can be against us? That's how I think. Everything which happens, and we know that all things are working together for my good. I'm not thinking. The boy I was born into glory. My mind, my mindset is glorious. And on the strength of this understanding of how my life is programmed, I deal with evil messlessly because I know it can't destroy him. I know it cannot destroy him. It's a mindset. God wants us to possess. We need to understand where we are. If your life is leading with challenges upon challenges, you need to switch mentally to the realm where your imaginations are all glorious. You wake up in the morning and you are fully aware in your spirit that the thing will be. I'm glorified. In eternities, I was glorified and the word of God does not fail. So it's just a matter of time. The thing will be. It will be. My life is glorious. Now, due to this current estate, we find ourselves in God, in fact, God prophetically blessed us with entitlement. He expects us to possess by our prayers and confessions because we are a people of glory. He blessed us. In Isaiah chapter 60, we are told to arise and shine. Listen to the language of scripture. It says, arise and shine because the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Arise and shine because the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. It is another way of saying, arise and shine because you live in glory. There's a consciousness that empowers us to live a glory-filled life. It's a knowledge we must have in our spirit that we live in glory. God has glorified us. You may not be seeing it now, but immediately you begin to switch consciousness and begin to walk in this dimension of mentality or this consciousness not to dwell on problems, but to always imagine yourself in glory. Oh, oh, oh. You'll be amazed the way things begin to fall in line. But if all you see around you are setbacks, disappointments, challenges, failures, things which are not working, you are just like the guy who has stayed plunged to the cross. You are still at the cross. You are still uh, in the realm of suffering. And you see, the cross is the emblem of suffering and shame. The cross represents God's wrath, sufferings, cares, shame. When you read Galatians 3, 11, the Bible says, care is any man who hangs upon the tree. So the cross must be understood in the right perspective. Of course, the cross is important. It is hugely important to our faith. What I'm saying is just one dimension of the understanding of the cross. And I'm saying this in relation to the preaching today. The cross is hugely important. In fact, it is central to our faith. It's a defining point in our faith. However, it is not the end point of the line. I'm repeating myself. The cross is hugely important to our faith. It is a defining point of our faith. You cannot talk about salvation without talking about the cross. However, it is the middle point of the line, not the end point of the line. The end point of the line is the glory face. And currently, we are not at the cross. We've, Jesus took us beyond the cross. We are beyond the cross. We are in a state of glory. And so I still do not understand why the church has adopted the cross as a symbol of Christianity. I don't understand it. Constantine the Great brought it, and the Roman Catholic Church magnified it. And now it seems to be the symbol of the church. Anytime we want to show the symbol of Christianity is a cross. It doesn't have to be the cross. It doesn't have to be the cross. The cross is not a symbol of Christianity. <laughs> okay, let me not go into too much theology. But I think that because of this distortion, we have failed to see the fullness of the reality of the glory of God. 
God has placed in front of us for 1,700 years. Yeah, the authority says then we should stop wearing the cross as a necklace. It is true. We have stopped. It is true. We have to stop wearing the cross. It is not a symbol of Christianity. It's not a symbol of our faith at all. But this is deep theology and the conversation and the debates can go on. But today, God invites us to see his end plan of bringing many sons into glory. And he wants us to develop this state of mind that we live in glory. We live in glory. And on the strength of this insight, he wants us to begin to possess what is truly ours in Christ. Prophetically, he taught us 700 years before Christ came that we should arise and shine because his glory is upon us. I know what he said. Because you've been ushered into this realm of glory, even though darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people, he, the Lord, will arise upon you and his glory will continually be seen upon you. The Bible says the Gentiles shall come to your light because the glory of God is upon you and kings to the brightness of your glory. Am I speaking to somebody tonight? The Bible says all that gather, they will come to you because the glory of God is upon your life. The Bible says the forces of the Gentiles or the wealth of the Gentiles, the wealth of the nations shall come to you because of the glory of God upon your life. The dromedaries of Ephah, the rams of Nebaioth, all of them would come to you because of the glory of God upon your life. Though the flock of Kedah shall be gathered together unto you. The Bible says ships from Tashish. Tashish was a mining city. Since from Tashis will bring your sons from far with their silver and with their gold. Because God has glorified you. The Bible says, the sons of strangers shall build up your walls and their kings shall come to minister unto you. Great people shall come to bless you with their wealth because of the glory of God upon your life. The Bible says, our gates will continually be opened so that we, it, they will not be shut by day nor by night, so that men shall bring unto us the wealth of the Gentiles, and that their kings may be brought because of the glory of God upon our lives. The glory of Lebanon, the Bible prophesies, shall come unto us, the fig tree, the pine tree, the box together, to beautify the church of God, and he will make he, the place of his feet, which is a church, glorious. The Bible says the sons of those who have hated us and afflicted us, our enemies, they will come bending to us. And no, those who despise us, they will come and bow themselves at the soles of our feet. That's what the Bible says, because of the glory of God upon our lives. And this particular one hits me so much in my spirit. He says, because of the glory of God upon your life, God will make you an eternal excellency and the joy of many generations. I will make you an eternal excellency. And the joy of many generations. I don't know whether somebody gets this. Oh. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I will make you an eternal excellency and the joy of many generations. He says, for brass, I will bring gold. And for iron, I will bring silver. And for wood, brass. And for stones, iron. And I will make your officers peace and, and thine exact as righteousness. A little one amongst us in the church will be a thousand and a small one a nation. And he added, I, the Lord, will hasten to accomplish this. And as I reflected on the scripture, I came to the understanding that what causes God to hasten to perform this word is consciousness. When you begin to live in this realm of glory, in this consciousness of the glory of God, everything begins to gravitate towards you. Every good thing begins to gravitate towards you. I salute Pastor Chris. Eh? I salute Pastor Chris because for years, Pastor Chris, I mean, for like the past 40, 50 years, Pastor, 40 years, Pastor Chris has been living in this consciousness. And no wonder, no wonder he has achieved what he has achieved and God has used the dimensions we have seen. It's a consciousness you must develop. And to know that's a message. You need to switch from the, the consciousness of the sufferings and being despondent and being disappointed and being crying. and No, 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 no. Move from that to your consciousness of glory. You wake up in the morning and, and you know that you live in glory. 
build that strong awareness in your spirit and pray it out daily. Prophesy daily that you live in glory and every good thing comes to you. And you'll be amazed because you begin to attract every good thing. The glory of God attracts good things, blessings. Blessings gravitate towards you. Because those words you speak, they are instrumental and they have the capacity to become what you say they are. And so put on this strong consciousness of your current estate. You live in glory. That is the scripture. That is a word. You live in glory. Believe it. And say it aloud daily. I live in glory. And that is why the anchor song of Fanet over the years has been a blessing and continues to be a blessing. Head of thy church, triumphant, we joyfully adore thee. He says, so thou appear until you appear. Thy members here shall sing like those in glory. Why? Because we live in glory. And so until he appears and takes us with him, we will sing and we will rejuvenate and we will rejoice and we will live like people who live in glory. So thou appear, thy members here shall sing like those in glory. And that is the truth. Thank God for this unspeakable gift of the Spirit. The Lord bless you. We we'll continue the series next week with Pastor Ralph on the sufferings and the glory. God bless you and see you next week. Amen.